what, what would be useful is if um, everybody who's on the panel could just take a moment just to say who they are and um, something about themselves. Kieran, would you last like to say something about yourself? Hello, yes. Um, so my name's Kieran. I'm the coordinator of the Open Table Network, which is a growing partnership of Christian worship communities that welcome and affirm people who are lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, plus our families, friends, and all who want to belong in a loving and affirming community. Uh, thank you. Uh, so next on my list, uh, Gerard. Hi, everyone. I um, I think I, I told you quite a bit about myself in uh, the beginning of my talk. Um, yeah, that's probably <laughs> enough. <laughs> Are we talking to you, Gerard, or the four-year-old you? <laughs> oh, well, well, both of us. <laughs> uh, so, Alex, would you like to just come and say a couple of words? Um, like Jared, I suspect you've probably heard more than enough about me. Um, I guess the only thing that I'd add that I'm not sure if I mentioned is that I'm a URC minister and particularly a pioneer minister. Um, so looking at the edges of, of the church, basically. Yeah, lovely. Andrea? Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea King, and I'm here in my capacity as chair of the Creating Sanctuary group of interdenominational leaders that led the resources um, that Alex has been a key part of. Um, I'm a director, clinical director for the Anna Freud Centre in my day job, uh, and I volunteer um, as chair. Um, and I've also been reading uh, uh, as a ministerial student at Regent's Park College in Oxford uh, for the last six years, but I won't be ordained um, uh, uh, because of my protected characteristics by the denomination that I have uh, through uh, uh, most of my life been uh, worshipping. Thank you, Andrew. Jade? Hi everybody, my name's Jade and I am the volunteer director for Diverse Church and we support LGBTQIA plus young adults to flourish in terms of their identity and their faith um, and I work within fostering and safeguarding in my day job and support the YMCA in Ireland on their board as well. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. And last but not least, Bingo. Hi, uh, I'm Bingo. I am uh, a curate in uh, Toxteth in Liverpool um, and I'm involved in uh, the Creating Sanctuary project and uh, a couple of other things. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I almost feel like I don't know where to begin to ask questions of the panel because there's so much that came out of the breakout groups that um, we, could, we could have a look at all of the things that were discussed. But I think perhaps if I just um, we, we've talked a lot about what safeguarding is and the impact it's had on all of us and we've uh, there's been lots of discussion about uh, what, what experience you've had in the church but perhaps one place to start is where do you think a good place to start if you were if we were um, going to help somebody find some sanctuary where would be a good place to start within a church in, in terms of finding uh, an, an enabling sanctuary? Based on my own experience of churches, uh, mainly Catholic churches, certainly in terms of my sense of sanctuary and safety, I think as uh, LGBTQIA people, we are disempowered from a very, very early age to trust our gut instincts, um, and to trust that we're whole and that we really are made in the image of God. And I think I uh, expressed that a little bit in, in my talk, you know, on a good day. Yeah, great. But there's a lot of days where those those voices of doubt that I've been fed for such a long time um, just they, they continue to play. So I, for me, certainly within Quest, uh, our our starting point is to give people or, or to reassure people that they are already there and that it's not them that's wrong, 
but it's that the spaces that they want to occupy can be dangerous. They really can be dangerous places. And that it's the creation of that danger that is at fault. Um, and, and not the burden of fault that we've been asked to carry on behalf of those spaces. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think my starting point is, it is always, it sounds a bit glib, but you are really okay. You don't feel it and you might all, not always believe it, but you are okay. You are enough exactly as you are. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, it, it, say it really quickly. God, it's taken me 60 odd years and I'm still trying to, to get to that place where I really do believe this stuff and really do live it. Bingo, did you want to respond to that? Um, just to add uh, where I would start, um, really that churches need to start with repentance. Um, you know, th these, these things didn't come out of nowhere. This is people making choices um, and the choices that churches have made have led to people like me not feeling safe. Um, and that doesn't mean some ridiculous performative thing that's, you know, oh, woe is us, we were awful kind of thing, but actually proper repentance. Uh, mm. Alex? I think I'd go back even a step further than that because before churches can repent they need to realize that something's wrong and I actually think that sometimes the greatest lack of safety is in churches that think that they are liberal on these things because they don't know the harm that they are doing. I've never been to a church um, other than an open table community that actually uses the language I asked them to use about myself um, or about humanity or about God. Um, and so a lot of churches think that they're there and think that they don't have anything to repent for, but they're still saying God created man and woman. So they're still at the root of some of the cultural difficulties um, and political difficulties that trans people are facing at the moment. Um, so I think churches do have a long way to go on that journey. And I think the only way they can even start is to actually encounter um, the LGBT people who do feel safe enough to share their stories. Um, and to actually ask us to come and speak to them and help them to see some of the traps that they're perhaps falling into or laying for others. Yeah. Yes, Jade. I'm just loving the generosity of what people are sharing. Um, I, I think that the laying down of defences is really, really important. And for church communities to feel uh, willing, I suppose, to say, absolutely tell us so we welcome challenge and if this space I said earlier about the importance of of the person who is experiencing the space defining whether or not it's safe and um, so if someone feels that it is not safe then to have pathways and it might not be as straightforward for them to go directly to the minister for example and to say I need this to be different so mm -hmm. the church has to do a bit of thinking around that but to have pathways where um that challenge can be presented you know actually I, I find the volume really tricky or I find the language really inaccessible to me etc and for the church to say thank you so much for your generosity and sharing that and um, let's make changes together so laying down defenses mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that's quite a, a difficult place for some churches to be though Jay do you think um you know if you go say something to somebody quite often they they feel defensive about you're criticizing them and they don't want to enter into that space to to discuss it but i think it's a some way of dealing with that andrea yeah so i think being honest in this space and being balanced in this space are two really important things we're all trying to achieve together and, and one of the key kind of threads in some of what we're describing is we are representing impact and affect. This is the impact of how, as church, we have and are relating to each other and to the rest of the world. This is what it's doing 
this is the harm that it can cause and this is where we get it right yeah so you know sometimes we've got both I think we need to be honest with each other and with ourselves and say if after doing that uh, most of our church leaders will respond to that uh, they will respond spiritually personally theologically to impact and affect but if they don't then we need to really ask, is this a safe place for us to be? Do we belong here anymore? Or do we say enough now uh, and walk away? So that's the tension, I think, for us to actively consider. Yes, Kieran. Um, so uh, as I was uh, hearing the feedback from uh, the, the good folk in our breakout groups, I was reminded of a challenge that was given to me about eight years ago when I was on a panel um, speaking about um, LGBT and faith, and, and it was aimed at youth workers. So some were Christian youth workers, some were secular. And I was asked, you know, why do you stay in church? Because it, from what you've described, it sounds like an abusive relationship. And that question has stayed with me, and I still don't always know the answer. Um, and I certainly wasn't able on that day to give an answer that convinced them because, you know, in a secular context, maybe, um, you know, it's hard to find a shared vocabulary so that we could e each understand one another's experience. But, um, you know, I mean, our faith community, it can be a source of great resilience and hope, can't it? But we know from the experiences we've shared that it can be a source of great, great harm and hurt as well. And, and there's a real tension in trying to hold those spaces um, together. But one of the things I found helpful when I talk to churches considering hosting an open table community is not to start with, you know, how have you been traumatized or how has the church hurt you? But to actually to, to seek out what's working and to seek to do more of that. So I will ask a church community to, and individual um, uh, members of that community to reflect on when you have felt most welcome, affirmed, empowered, um, and to share that, you know, in, in small, in twos or threes, and then to reflect on the qualities of that experience and what um, about those qualities, what were the qualities of that experience and how we could recreate those experiences for other people. So we focus on what's worked for us individually and together and be intentional and clear about the desire to offer more of that to more people. Yeah. Uh, Kieran's put something in the chat about where some dioceses are beginning to initiate a specific ministry chaplaincy dialogue to with in partnership with LGBT and communities and organisations. I think that picks up quite a lot of um, the issues about not speaking for us, but allowing us to speak for ourselves, uh, which is quite important. And, and Kathy, I can see your hand up. Did you want to come in and ask a question? No, I have a question that has a bit of a gentle challenge in it, which is, I think as um, we move to more churches kind of picking up the baton for um, trying to include LGBTQ people, what's going to happen um, is, as in my experience, churches that are sort of big flag-waving inclusive churches, there can still be incidents and problems with homophobia, with abuse of power, with spiritual abuse. I'm not going to go through my story. I think it's familiar to some people here. Um, but I tried very hard to work with the rector of my church because obviously it was in my interest to resolve what happened to me, um, but couldn't get support. And so I then went to LGBT Christian organisations. And I had a real mix, actually. Um, one fantastic online space that allowed a lot of participation and discussion. And I've really enjoyed being in that space. Um, one person told me basically to be quiet and go away. Um, one organization provided me with a spiritual advisor, which has been incredibly helpful and such a blessing to me. Um, and one organization didn't offer me any help, but did make a video about my church saying it was inclusive, borrowing a lot of LGBT people who don't attend it. So my experience has been really mixed. And so that's my gentle challenge to you. What do you think is your role in your organizations when someone comes to you saying, I've had a really rough time in an inclusive church, I've been trying to, or you know, or an open table church, whatever it may be, it's not a sanctuary. I've tried very hard through 
professional and appropriate means to get it sorted out and the person's not listening to me because my experience sadly overall has been of being quite disempowered by some of the LGBT campaigning organisations and I would really like that not to happen to other people because I do believe in your mission and what you're trying to achieve so I hope I've asked that in a gentle challenging way um, I'm particularly interested I guess in hearing from Alex and Jade and Kieran but I'm interested in what your response is to you know what would happen if someone comes to you saying I've been through this as much as possible thank you Cathy yeah I think Alex is going to come in there and respond to you I think the first thing I'd have to say Cathy and I hope you know me well enough to know that I mean this kindly is that it's a very hard question to answer without referring to an individual and in their circumstances because how we would respond would be different to every individual bearing in mind what's happened but I think I'd also say that it's important to recognize that Christian LGBTQ plus organizations um, aren't in a place where we have power yet it might seem like it but actually our power is very limited and often the only power we have is to help someone to feel heard and to share their story but whether or not we actually have power to impact structural change um is a different question and i would as unhelpful and academic as it may be i would point to the structures of our denominations as the source of these power di dynamics and difficulties and because we don't control the disciplinary structures of our denominations um that's an issue and that is something that personally i will always speak out about um but i think a lot of structural change is absolutely necessary before we're in a position to respond adequately um, to these really complex situations. Thank you. Jade? Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Cathy, for, for sharing um, that experience and, and your really helpful and challenging question. Um, and I think it kind of in line of what I said before, that we as an organization in diverse church for example and we here in gathering voices and all of the the we's that that we have um we need to really be open to hearing challenge and and we need to be open to seeing where the gaps are um and in terms of of dc we've had similar experiences where people have said all sorts of stuff to do with their churches for example and exclusion and discriminatory experiences they had their workplaces, their schools, their families, um, so, so, so many contexts. And similar to what Alex said, you know, the response is obviously different depending on the individual. Uh, one of the main things for us would be trying to really identify what actually is the need. So it's not about me or anybody else in DC assuming to know the need or know what the response should be. And also sometimes the person who has experienced the oppression isn't in a place to be able to recognize either what the need is. And it can be very hard to articulate that. So the first thing we do is create a bit of space and, and try and do that non-defensive listening. Um, but where there is a need, for example, for advocacy or for someone to accompany this person to a meeting, for example, um, we would do that, that kind of thing and hopefully raise in that process that it shouldn't have required that for for this individual to feel heard and to feel valued um, and also Kathy just on a final note one of the things that that we are really trying to do within DC is to acknowledge um where we fall short so for example DC is much more accessible to people who are white than to black people and people of color and that is a problem um, so we we have to recognize the intersectionality and we have to recognize the layers of what can actually cause trauma, distress, discrimination, and heartache. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, Kieran, did you want to come in? I know uh, Cathy laid down the uh, challenge to you as well, didn't she? Well, I'm I'm pleased to say that I have the privilege of working closely with Alex Claire Young um, as uh, as myself as the coordinator of Open Table Network. Alex as co-chair with a particular responsibility for pastoral care and safeguarding. So. Um, I don't. I think Alex has uh, spoken so eloquently about this. I don't feel I've got anything to add. But I, we do accept the challenge and also recognise that, yeah, you know, we aren't meeting everyone's need all the time, and we're we're constantly need to be a learning and listening organisation too. 
I am conscious we've only got a few minutes left. So does anybody have any sort of final comments they would like to make or anything to add to that? Yes, Gerard? You need to put your microphone on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would reiterate the, the point that we don't have power, but one of the things that I think we do have is the capacity to influence and, and we influence ourselves, we influence others like us, and we influence um, our churches. And one of the ways that we can do that is by paying attention to the language that we are using that reinforces or is countercultural to the, the power dynamics that are around. So, for example, I try and use Big C Church and Little C Church. Little C Church is the buildings without, with, uh, and if they're without people, they aren't church. They're just empty buildings. And they're only Big C Church when they're doing what they need to do. Now, that's a sliding scale of, you know, that's a different discussion. But also, when I refer to church generally, church teaches. Church doesn't teach. Our hierarchy have policy statements. Mm -hmm that they call teaching. And I will very, very carefully use language to position some of the bad behavior that goes on. So I often refer to the Catholic Church as a multinational organization, which has some really bad policies. And bishops are only bishops when they are functioning as bishops. At other times, they're area managers. And I will use the language, I'll use my language carefully to try and clarify to people where we are within this scheme of things. So, you know, it's a, a, a small drop in a big ocean. <laughs> so. Yes, Bingo. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate a bit of what I said when I was feeding back from my group that, you know, we need to be real about the fact uh, about the trauma that people are carrying with them um, and that that trauma may often mean that they will never be able to engage with an inherited church model of any sort. Um, you know, uh, there are songs that I can't listen to uh, and they are perfectly lovely songs. And if I hear them, I start getting panicky and worried because of the connection they have with trauma that I've experienced. And, you know, I, I ran, helped run a church, a fresh expression, where there were people who could not walk through the door of a church building, anything that looked like a church without having a panic attack. And kind of, as churches, we need to be totally working on including people and getting people through the door, and but also recognising that there will be people who that's not a possibility and we need to build church around them rather than pulling them in yeah now i think we could go on because there's so much uh, things that we've talked about this afternoon i'm just conscious that we we are coming to the end of this point and can i just thank the panel for your insights and your help and thank you kathy for your question um i think it it challenged us and it, it was it was a really valid and helpful question thank you